Hello, I'm Chris van Scharnenberg, Head of Collections at the Tank Museum. Welcome to the latest episode of the Tank Workshop Diaries. We were closed for a long time, as you know, at the Tank Museum, but we reopened in July, uh, which is great. We have been doing, be able to do some work in the workshop and some events, but obviously it's all very limited and a lot of the guys are still on furlough. However, one of the things we did pick up, uh, which was an idea from much long before the lockdown, is visiting other museums and their workshops to see how they look after their collections. And the, uh, the museum we decided to visit first is the Fleet Air Museum for two reasons. It's just down the road at Yeovilton, so not too far from us. And also they've helped us recently with a project, the Yak Panther uh, repaint project. Um, the Yak Panther repaint uh, caused a lot of interest and a lot of questions from the online visitor, which is great. We always like to engage with the visitors and see what they think. And some of the, we listen to the comments and we're trying to uh, answer some of your questions you had about the repainting of the Yak Panther. We did an article which is on our website and you can see the link below. Um, the Fleet Air Museum is the, uh, deals with the British Naval Aviation, has over 100 aircraft, some fantastic uh, aircraft in their collection. And we're going to visit um, Dave Morris, the curator there, who I've worked with for many years. He was always very keen to support other museums. We are here in the workshop of the Fleet Air Museum. Uh, you may be able to hear a helicopter hovering outside because it's still a very active uh, air station here, Royal Naval Air Station Yeovilton. And we're here with Dave Morris. Dave has been the longtime curator here at the Fleet Air Museum. We, we cover a lot of aspects with our workshop working. We do many, many things rather than just what people would consider to be that blanket word restoration. As you can see in here at the moment, we've got our Fairy Barracuda rebuild. Um, and this is a very, very extensive, detailed rebuild using a number of crash sites. Um, we're sifting through and analyzing the parts beginning to recreate and rebuild a Barracuda aircraft. There are no other Barracudas existing anywhere in the world, so it's a very important project, trying to use as much of the original material as we can before we cut any new metal. It's a real mixed bag of conservation and restoration and rebuild techniques all feeding into this one project. So which part of the plane are we actually looking at? This is the cockpit. This is where the pilot would sit. The pilot would be in a seat here. Control panel would be here, engine would be in front there, and then of course the rest of the aircraft will eventually extend back um, some 46 feet behind. So it's, it's a big airplane. Torpedo bomber from World War II, three-man crew, it's quite a large aircraft. The components on the floor were uh, recovered from the Solent off of, off of Portsmouth, but we have been collecting components for 40 years plus in the museum from other crash sites, from high ground and mountainside crash sites in Great Britain. The importance of the Solent wreck as well is that it belly landed onto the sea at a relatively low speed and then just sank to the bottom. The pilot escaped uh, okay and the aircraft sank to the bottom and just be settled in the sand and, and remained there for 74 years. The other crash site wreckage components that we have have all had very, very harsh, abrupt mountainside crashes, so all of the wreckage is very, very torn and distorted um, and, and bent out of shape. So much of the Solent wreck is still dimensionally correct, so even though it looks uh, in, in really unusable condition, huge portions of it are able to be cleaned up into really, really good useful parts, which is, which is remarkable, but as much, again, is useful as completely accurate dimensional uh, parts that we can scale from. It's a slow progress. Uh, we don't have all of the information. We only have certain amounts of Barracuda drawings, but most of it is analyzing the actual hardware itself, whether it's the Solent hardware or whether it's the mountainside crash hardware, and just working out ourselves which bits are bent, which bits are useful, which bits have to be reworked or which bits can be saved. What you see in this jig so far is a about 90% plus of original material that has been in crash sites. So it's a long, painstaking job to straighten out and clean and identify and then reuse those components. We could start and make a reasonable attempt at a Barracuda out of just new metal, but it would not have any history to it. It would not be original in any way, and it would not be as accurate as this. This is going to be a longer, much more painstaking process uh, but it will incorporate a very, very high percentage of original Barracuda, albeit from a number of different Barracuda aircraft. And it's not just the um, hardware, of course, it's the external, it's the paintwork we will also look at as well. 
paint is actually a really, really important part of these historic objects, whether they're cars or tanks or motorcycles or planes. Um, the paintwork is often really, really key to understanding more about the object, where it's been, who's handled it, or perhaps even which object it actually is. Well, talking about paint, let's have another look at uh, another project of yours that you did quite a few years ago now, but um, the Corsairs. Absolutely. Talk more about paint there as well. Now, I've known this project for quite a while, the Corsair. You did an awful lot of work on it, you even wrote a book on it in the end. Uh, can you talk us a little bit about the uniqueness of this Corsair behind us? It's not just any Corsair, it's the only Corsair left in its original markings and original paint. It is, it, 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 it is a unique object in that sense that there are many Corsairs in the world, but the way we treated this aircraft and the way we looked at this project, um, we ended up with what we believe is the only Corsair left in the world in its totally original World War II service colors and markings. In this instance, the Corsair I'd known for many years and the 1960s and 70s paint layer that had been put on uh, looked like it had been just put on top of what we believed at that time was the very original wartime paint finish. No undercoats and no, no serious abrasing. No. So we started and we just literally picked and peeled inch by inch, foot by foot across the whole aircraft. It took us five years. Paint is so important in, in studying an object. It's not always possible to, to achieve this. Objects can get painted or altered in museums um, without that object critical thinking, without people just stopping and looking at the object and seeing what the object has to say for itself before they race to maybe strip it or paint it or, or do something more invasive with it. I mean, straight away, you see, I find it fascinating because you just know that paint was put on during the Second World War and in a way it makes it much more, you see the history of it with all the wear and tear marks where the guys climbed on the wings, rubbing down the paint and even on the, the gun ports, how it's been taped down, I assume, with fabric before it fires it off during firing. Everything you see is just what we've uncovered. We've not mimicked or replicated or made it look distressed or whatever. We had no idea there would be so many important details and witness marks and finds. And from those details, paint markings, transfers, bits of damage that we could identify, uh, details from the factory build, details from in-service modifications and accidents, all of that we could actually analyze and prove time-datable incidents matched up with records or record cards or pilot's logbooks. We could start to put the whole um, mm -hmm. sequence of this aircraft true life together. The unit markings? Yeah, unit markings originally in white, but then of course we discovered with careful cleaning away that they changed to pale blue. Well, that's the color code change for Southeast Asia Command. So this aircraft was destined to go to Southeast Asia Command. And so the story went on. But all of this evidence, all of these paint markings, all of the markings on the paint, the scratches, like you say, uh, all of these witness marks build up into a whole catalogue of evidence that we could really understand this airplane's actual history. So here the uh, Grumman Martlet, as it was known in British service, can you talk us a bit more as well? You've got the original paint on the wings, you did a very similar project to the Corsair, but you did something different with the fuselage. Can you explain a bit more? We did. This, this, this was a follow-on project from Corsair KD-431. Uh, it was another aircraft we'd identified as very significant original paint. When we stripped it carefully though, when we started the paint archaeology, when we started that inch by inch removal of the 1960s and 70s paint, we began to realize that the wings, the tail surface, the, the stabilator, parts of the cockpit still had original paint. What we began to notice though was the fuselage had been stripped completely back to bare aluminium. The more we analysed that, and when we say analyse, I mean we got down with microscopes and, and absolutely you know, high definition analysing of the crack lines, the rivets around the rivet heads, down these aluminium um, sheet seams, we began to notice that there were remnants, tiny bits of evidence that showed the difference between the dark green and the light green. We began to see that even though it is wet stripped with paint stripper, you could still find those little bits of, of critical detail. Well, that gave us the final decision that what we would do is represent the paint scheme based on our best evidence that we could find during an, that analysis. Uh, but before we just race to putting the paint onto those original skins, what we decided to do was put a barrier coat on top of that original skin work so that we could always get back to and find that original detail if we needed to. I would love to see an original picture of AL246, we've yet to find one, but if we decide that 
having found an original photograph, it doesn't match accurately enough. We could then, of course, remove that barrier layer coat and redo it again. Or in many, many years to come, anybody that really wanted to study that detail for whatever reason in the future would always be able to get back to it again. It means that you do have the flexibility to do something new or do something different or do something for a particular exhibition maybe, but you don't destroy and you don't contaminate the very valuable original paint or evidence which is, which is then sealed beneath. So yeah, in, in many ways it can give you the best of both worlds. So the Grumman Martlet here at the Fleet Iron Museum, that's where we got the idea from for the peel coat, because Dave, as you just explained, used the peel coat on the side of the fuselage to protect to be able to get back to what's underneath it, that, that you don't paint over it and it's very difficult to get back to it. So he can just peel this back and I want to do the same for the Jagdpanzer because we only had a short time to come up with a scheme that, that helped support the, um, the sponsorship. So we thought, okay, let's put a peel coat on it. We wanted to test the peel coat on the Jagdpanzer for that same reason that in the future you can go back to what's underneath it, that you don't just add layers and layers to it. So it allows us going forward to take it off and then do a proper paint research on the Yak Panther to know exactly what it should be in. And hopefully, as Dave explained, you will always find evidence around, in this case, rivet heads or the, the sheets. And we will probably find the same on the Yak Panther. There will be evidence somewhere of what the paint should be. And then we can properly research it, copy it, and then paint it in the correct color scheme and the color codes. But the idea came here from the Fleet Air Museum, used on aircraft, in this case, the Grumman Martlet. So here we are in phase two of the Second World War exhibition. Uh, we recently opened phase one early in the year and now we're completely designing the layout of um, phase two. So the vehicles will stay in place, but the stories will be told around it now. So look around you here, all the vehicles in the Second World War will have been repainted over the last 75 years. They're all 75 years old roughly. And they will have been repainted for a variety of reasons. A lot of these vehicles would have spent time outside here when at the tank museum or they had to be repainted to fit in with a particular type of exhibition. So you don't quite know what's underneath it. In some cases, you don't know what the, the history is of the, the vehicle itself. However, it doesn't mean that the inside isn't completely intact. For example, the, uh, the flail here, the Sherman flail, we, we were in it recently for a complete survey, and the inside is beautiful. It's like a time capsule. It's all there, all the equipment is there, all the paint is original, as a, it's like a wartime machine on the inside, which is really unique. Um, but yeah, the outside will have been repainted. I'm not judging it. It's just what happened and what maybe had to be done. But it all depends, just tying it back to the discussion about the Yak Panther, how would they have repainted? Would they have blasted the entire vehicle down so there's no evidence of it from what was before or is the original paint underneath it? And you could have the same discussion about every single vehicle in here because they will all have been repainted at some stage. Some vehicles, like the Stug, which was on loan to the Imperial War Museum at Duxford for many years, has now, as of last year, it came back to the museum. It's quite unique because it's a very original vehicle. All the original Zimmerit is on it and you can see straight away all the different layers of paint. And I'm not saying the, the last coat is original, it probably isn't, but what it allows you to look at is all the different color schemes. And you see straight away three, three four different paint colors. So what allows you to actually go back to it and peel those layers back. I think the guys, Jonathan and, and Bob, when they did the Matilda dives, they used the word industrial archeology, span and that's really what it is. And they did the same, if you look back at the Matilda diaries, when there was original paint behind bins, uh, they kept it and they preserved it, it's still there. We, we matched the color scheme and then we painted, in this case, the inside and the exterior of the vehicle using that original paint. And that's the same you can do here. And many of these other vehicles will have that same issue. Underneath will be evidence of, even if the vehicle has been completely blasted, where things have never been removed, on wheel stations or in nooks and crannies, you will be able to find the original paint. And as a museum, that is quite exciting. And that is something we want to do with the Yak Panther in the future as well. Go back to the original and match it and then paint it properly. Uh, but yeah, all these vehicles in here, we've got about 60 vehicles in the Second World War, they all have a story that needs to be told and that's often underneath it. And while we can now in the museum thinking is, let's display the vehicles for what they really are. Even if that means it was a training vehicle during the war, like the Matilda II, or, um, or whatever the history is. And that's part of the, the excitement of working in a museum and finding out what the history is of that vehicle. In these difficult times, obviously your support is really valued. So please do keep following us on social media, do subscribe to our channel. And, and if you've got the opportunity, perhaps order something from our shop, uh, join one of our schemes like Patreon or our friends organization, and we'll try and keep going with giving you some content to keep you informed and entertained.